Good evening, everybody. Suspect Sky here. I think the uh, news of the day today is the delay of NASA's TESS Exoplanet Hunter satellite delayed due to a rocket issue. This was supposed to launch today. Uh, TESS stands for the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. It essentially will be doing a two-year survey of the entire sky and will likely find thousands more of exoplanets. For those scientifically minded, we have a long article here that discusses a lot of the proposed usages of the satellite, uh, ranging from uh, what direction to point it, how to point it, how long to point it. Uh, for those who may not know, the longer you point one of these telescopes at a particular portion of the sky, the uh, more detail you can get out of the image. This article is great. It's, it's quite long, uh, but it, it's great in sort of describing a lot of what this satellite is expected to do, a lot of what the authors, the, uh, the physicists in this article recommend that it should be doing, and essentially we're going to be able to find about thousands more of exoplanets. And you can check out this pretty neat video here. It, it explains quite a bit uh, about what this, uh, satel or what this satellite is, is going to be doing. Essentially, it's going to be finding new Earth-like planets out there. So the, the satellite in general is designed to detect planets around other solar systems that are smaller than Neptune. Best telescopes we've had out there to date, including Kepler, these telescopes are much better at detecting very large objects, uh, Jupiter-sized and even larger. Uh, and Kepler does this by detecting the wobble that these large objects make on uh, their local star. But this satellite is going to be able to detect planets that are smaller than Neptune. This is very exciting, and that's, that's particularly exciting because life as we know it requires a much lower gravity than a planet such as Jupiter. But all this is going to be hailed in, in comparison to the James Webb Telescope, which is scheduled to launch in 2020. And this telescope is going to have the capability of actually seeing the atmospheres of these exoplanets. What's really exciting about this is we're going to be able to tell what kind of chemicals, uh, what kind of chemical composition of the atmosphere of an exoplanet that we have. And over a long enough period of time, we're going to be able to detect changes in, say, uh, carbon dioxide or oxygen or other uh, various elements that might make up their atmospheres. And we likely would be able to detect uh, the influence that plant-based life might have on an atmosphere. So when this, when this satellite launches, we are going to be in a very good position to detect uh, at least plant or other type of bacterial-based life that may be influencing their uh, local planet's atmosphere. And all of these things uh, definitely influence this old equation called the Drake Equation. So the Drake Equation is this idea that we can estimate the number of civilizations we may be able to have contact with via radio or other type of signal by using this equation, uh, R times yada yada. And here are the different variables involved in that equation. Uh, R is the average rate of stars to form. Uh, the fraction of those stars that create planets, the average number of, of habitable planets that cre are created per each of those stars, and then it goes down through a number of other variables. But what both of these satellites are going to be able to do is really pin down these two variables. Uh, the fraction of stars that form planets and the average number of habitable planets per star and to a degree, the James Webb is going to be able to tell us how many uh, of these habitable planets will life emerge from, uh, even if it's just simple plant-based life. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting time. I'm, I'm looking forward to this test satellite being launched, and I'm looking forward to how it may uh, influence our understanding and our ability to predict life on other worlds. Uh, so I highly recommend that, that the audience checks out this article here, which is uh, just a, a deluge of, of information and math. You can see here, this is a nice graph here. It says uh, the average number of planets detected per the trial bin per 2,400 giant planets. But if you look to the left, you can see that this is multiplied by uh, a little bit over 10 to the third power. Uh, so if you kind of multiply all these out, you're going to get a rough approximation of how many planets this thing is expected to find. And that is really going to modify 
uh, this Drake equation, or, or at least more clearly define the variables, uh, our understanding of them. Because when this Drake equation was created, we had no idea that planets even formed around other stars. Now, you know, decades later, we have a much better idea that, you know what, quite frankly, the idea that planets form around stars is kind of the rule and not the exception to the rule. Uh, we're also getting a lot of data that uh, a lot of these planets are in the habitable zone, like Trappist, and pretty soon we're going to have an idea of are these planets uh, not only in the habitable zone, uh, but are they actually able of producing at least plant life? And we're going to be able to do that by detecting the atmospheric signatures uh, using the James, James Webb's telescope. So, uh, you know, as kind of a concluding thought, I, I think it's pretty exciting that, that mainstream science is at least starting to realize that extraterrestrial life is probably more of uh, the norm uh, based on the uh, available data that we have and based on continuing observations that we keep making. Uh, and the better technology we create, uh, the better estimates we have, and they keep reaching the same conclusion, we are likely not alone. So anyway, just want to thank the audience for joining on this quick little news update, and hopefully this TESS satellite will be launching tomorrow. If it does. We'll be here to let you know how that all went. Uh, anyways, everybody, thank you and have a good night.